Good evening and welcome to the second James A. Thurber Dialogue in Democracy, a series of conversations with prominent thought leaders about the growing threats to democracy and what we can do about it. I'm David Barker, the director of the Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies here at AU, and I'll be your host tonight. Our mission at the Center is to strengthen the democratic square through research, public events, and hands-on training programs, and we're proud to co-sponsor this event with AU's government department, the Kennedy Political Union, and the United States Historical Capital Historical Society. These dialogues celebrate the illustrious career of our beloved colleague, distinguished university professor, James A. Thurber. Jim is transitioning to emeritus status this summer after 47 illustrious years studying American democracy, contributing to it, and enlightening others about it. He's quick to point out that he is not actually retiring, however, he is under contract for two books after all, among other things. Our guest tonight, much to our delight, is the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and historian, Anne Applebaum, one of the world's foremost experts on the rise of authoritarianism around the globe. She's a staff writer for The Atlantic and a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, where she co-directs ARENA, a program on disinformation and 21st century propaganda. In previous lives, she was a longtime colonist, columnist and editorial board member for the Washington Post, the political editor of the Evening Standard, a correspondent for The Economist, among many other things. She's the author of six highly acclaimed books, including most recently, Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. At any point during the dialogue between Dr. Thurber and Ms. Abbott, feel free to post a question in the Q&A box. We will reserve about 10 or 15 minutes at the end to get through as many of these questions as we can. Please remember to keep your questions civil, to skip the ideological grandstanding, and to honor Alex Trebek by posing your question as an actual question. Okay, now I will hand the virtual microphone to my colleague, distinguished professor Jeff Gill, who also just so happens to have been a student of Dr. Thurber's once upon a time. He will formally introduce Dr. Thurber uh, who will then uh, begin talking to Ms. Applebaum. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you, David. Um, good evening to everybody. It is my pleasure to an honor to introduce distinguished professor James A. Thurber tonight. He is a distinguished colleague in every way. Um, he, uh, he has greatly affected the lives, careers, and trajectories of countless American university students, including me. Uh, his PhD pro seminar in American politics was literally the first political science course I ever took. And after one lecture, I was hooked. Thank you for that, Jim. Um, I don't want to take too much time from the fascinating program we have tonight, but I do want to highlight one brief thing uh, about his scholarship that I've always admired. The hallmark of Professor Thurber's study of politics and political systems is that events are critically driven by the characteristics of the political actors involved. For example, uh, campaigns do not just win because of effective strategy, theme, and message. They also win because the specific people making those decisions matter. His studies of individuals, who, um, his studies of administrative legislative interaction demonstrate the character and personalities of presidents, members of Congress, and the people who serve them vitally determine political outcomes in Washington. And, and I could go on and on and about this point, I won't do that. He has seen and communicated the process behind the data his entire career. And I learned a lot from that. Anyways, with these brief remarks, I will turn the virtual microphone over to Dr. Thurber. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, uh, thank you, David, also. Uh, and Anne, welcome. Uh, you are an international uh, treasure in the sense that sometimes you're in Poland, sometimes you're in London, sometimes you're in Berlin various places, but we're lucky you're in Washington DC now. So we're not in a uh, six time zone problem today. And I really enjoyed uh, Twilight of Democracy, the Seduction, Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. This is the book. I want everybody, if they haven't purchased it yet, go out and buy it for all of your friends and yourself. It's great. It's a book that's unique in the sense uh, that it starts out and ends with a party in Poland at your place in Poland. And 
the um, um, the book. Sorry, there's something going on with my my camera. Uh, the book really discusses demo, uh, discuss, discusses the democratic decline, the rise of right wing populism uh, with authoritarian tendencies in three main cases: uh, Poland, UK and the United States. This also includes Hungary. I've been to Hungary several times. I know some of the reformers there, so I found that very interesting also. But back to the party. You had a New Year's Eve party in 1999, uh, and you had friends and acquaintances that attended, and they were sort of center-right proponents uh, of democracy and free market uh, liberals. And you trace their evolution uh, to the modern day in terms of changes of attitudes and behaviors. And so I'd like to start with that uh, by asking you what happened to the attitudes and behaviors of these guests over time. Uh, did, were they seduced by the lure of authoritarianism, some of them? So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I grew up around the corner from AU and when I was in high school, I used to work in the AU library and actually, even in some interim years, I've, I've gone back there. Um, when I was working on my Gulag book, I once spent a summer in Washington and sat in the, in the stacks there. So, so I, 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 feel, I, I feel right at home with, with AU. Well, I'm glad um, you do. Welcome. <laughs> so, so thank you. Um, I, and, I, and I should also say, I wish I was there physically and rather not just virtually, but maybe we'll, maybe we'll get to that. Um, another right. Time. Um, so yes, the book does begin with a party and um, it, it, it begins that way, not because I'm some kind of great hostess or because I give a lot of parties, um, but because the party was given in 1999 on New Year's Eve, um, the, the, you know, the eve of the millennium. And about 20 years later, 19, 18, 19 years later, I started to think about the party and I realized that about half the people there um, were not people who I know anymore. Um, but these weren't just normal personal fallings out or, or people drifting away from each other. I realized that about half of the party no longer spoke to the other half of the party. Um, and that was because what had been a, a milieu, a kind of center-right, anti-communist, you could say Thatcherite, although that's an odd word used in Poland, but you could say free market, you could say pro-democracy group, that had been, and, and, and these were mostly younger people, nobody there was very significant or famous. Um, but these were, you, you know, these are people who you could have characterized as be, having one set of political views. Um, two decades later, were not at all. Um, one group um, had, I think, remained in more or less the same place. That's how I would describe myself. Although the issues that I'm confronted with now are so different from the ones I was confronted with 20 years ago. And maybe we can talk about that, I think makes, once you start making political choices, things change. But there was another group who went off in a very different direction and became what is, um, what can only be described as, as the radical right. I mean, they became a, they became, most of these were journalists and political strategists and some, some, some politicians, some MPs. Um, and most of them are now affiliated with a, um, a kind of nationalist Catholic political party that's the current ruling party in Poland um, and who, which has since it first won an election in 2015, since it first took full power in 2015, um, has very consciously and actively chipped away at many of the fundamental building blocks of democracy. So attacking court independence, they did a, immediately did an unconstitutional court packing move as soon as they took office. Um, uh, replaced the civil service with, got rid of experts of all kinds, replaced them with um, party hacks, um, made big changes in the cultural and educational sphere, um, and, and, and also began to chip away at the independence of the media, mostly through strategies like, you know, announcing high taxes on anybody who advertises in independent media, while at the same time pumping huge amounts of money into state media, um, and making state media into something that's very hard to describe actually outside of Poland, but it's a kind of very, very extremist um, propaganda channel. I mean, there, there, it's, a, it's the, you know, the national television channel, something like 30% of the country, it's the only television channel they get. They also of course have radio stations and other, other, other forms of communication. And it's now 
very extreme right. Um, it's homophobic, it's xenophobic, it's sometimes anti-Semitic. Um, and it's of course very, very biased in its coverage of, of politics. And they've, you know, they, and they, this is a kind of package of moves that they've carried out. And some of the people who I used to know um, are now part of that, um, part of that milieu. They've gone in that direction. Um, so you, I, sorry, yes? Yeah, so you talk about the building blocks of democracy. Um, I don't think there's a consensus ab exactly about what democracy is. And I'd like no, you to not. talk about that a bit, uh, especially since uh, we've had this, uh, uh, the lowering of the status of our democracy in the United States recently in this national ranking. Um, and if there's no consensus about, about democracy, let's jump to Biden right now and Biden's statement just this week when he said, uh, in his address to the Munich Security Conference last week, Biden said, stressed the importance of partnerships with allies in Europe. Uh, we quote, we are in the midst of fundamental debate about the future and direction of our worlds, a contest between democracy and autocracy. We don't have a clear definition from our government in the United States, what the democracy is, how, how, how can his mission be pursued if there's no clear definition of democracy? And what's your definition of democracy? I'm not sure there's no clear definition of democracy. I mean, I think we've all moved beyond the, you know, the idea that it's just elections. Um, I think we, I think there's a general understanding that democracy requires not just elections, but it requires some kind of, or some elements of a, of an even playing field so that there are some kinds of neutral institutions that can ensure the rule of law, regardless of who wins the election, and also that there's some kind of consensus. So, um, you know, and, and in a way, of course, democracy is very, it's almost anti-human nature. I mean, what it really requires is that, uh, you know, when you win an election, you have to then agree to keep certain pillars of the system in place so that your enemies can defeat you in four years time if they win. Um, and and on, on the country, if you lose an election, you have to agree that the other party is allowed to rule. Um, so you'd say majority rule, the consent and the governed, yeah, free and fair elections, but also protection of minority rights. Well, well the, but, but as I was saying, I mean, there have to be, there, there uh, you know, and, and I don't want to be too, um, you know, too prescriptive because there are a lot of different kinds of democracies. And as you know well enough, I mean, there are presidential democracies and parliamentary democracies and majoritarian democracies and consensus democracies, and they, they all function in different ways, you know, and have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, but they have some things in common. And as I said, one of them is the, 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 the rulers change with, you know, following a vote. Um, and the other is that there are institutions in place that ensure the protection of minorities that ensure um, certain, you know, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of the press, um, and that make it possible for elections to be conducted in some kind of free and fair manner. So I, I'm not sure that the, the, the diff, I mean, there is of course a question around the edges, you know, who counts as a democracy and who doesn't. And I hope that the Biden administration isn't gonna get bogged down in that, which yeah, sometimes okay. so the, happens. The economic intelligence unit, uh, in London, uh, just came out with uh, their ranking of, of democracies, and we've gone from a full democracy to a flawed democracy. And uh, from your writing, you may agree with this. I think that it's directly related to the president that we had, Trump, and what he did over the last four years and what he did after the election. Um, beyond the US, though, there's uh, it seemed like a terrible year for democracies, if you've read their report. Uh, they included all the elements that you had and a few other elements in terms of their definition uh, of democracy and that, quote, the lure, uh, the seductive lure of authoritarianism seems to be moving in many nations throughout the world. And so then the central question that you address in your book is, what is that seduct seductive lure and, and why do the why do the intellectuals and upper class many times go along with it? in these countries, including Poland. Right, so for, first of all, just one little point is that I think Trump was the, was the product of a deterioration of American democracy that had been going on for a while. Yes. Um, so we can just leave that, leave that yeah. aside. I think there's consensus about that. But yeah, yeah. But, but, the, 
The law of authoritarianism is something that I think we in America long underestimated. Um, um, and the, you know, the idea that there could be unity, the idea that there could be just one voice, um, the idea that the nation could pull together, that there wouldn't be these petty squabbles. Um, this is something that appeals to a lot more people than, um, than, we, than we normally want to acknowledge, including people in our own country. Um, but I think if you, you, you ask me what unifies the, you know, the intellectuals and, 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 and others and journalists who, who find this, these kind of movements attractive, and, and I, this is the topic of my book, I look at them across different countries. Right. I would say that, I, I would say that they're unified by a sense of disappointment, that they are, for a variety of different reasons, disappointed with how democracy has turned out in their country. Um, either they, they don't like the direction that um, the country is going demographically, don't like the kind of country it's becoming, um, they don't like the, the, the morality of the country. Sometimes it's personal, you know, they don't like the role that they have been assigned or they, I mean, I, I, one of the characters in my book is a Polish, um, a, a Polish, uh, he's, he's now a, the editor of state, the state television channel that I described and he, as a, as a teenager, was a solidarity activist. He was an anti-communist activist and he became very angry in post-communist Poland by the fact that he felt he should be playing a bigger role than he had been assigned and he became resentful of the system um, and angry that that it hadn't promoted himself um, that was part of his that's clearly part of his motivation yes you write about that in your book and it's yeah persuasive it's not, but it's that not is everybody's motivation but but yeah. the the sense of disappointment either personal or political or philosophical that this isn't what i wanted this isn't what i bargained for this is the this is the sense that leads people to demand radical change because once you no longer like or admire your own country, then the idea that you should change it with some, you should smash it up, you should, we should, you know, we need some, you know, violent or, or, or dramatic change begins to become, and this is, of course, the source of radicalism of the left and the right. Um, it's just that the, the, the right-wing radicalism has had more energy in the last several years. So you, you in what you've just stated, uh, but in your book, you, you cover this, you didn't really talk about economics. What was the impact of the Great Recession of 2008 uh, on this movement towards authoritarianism in, in Europe? So I, I, think it was, I think it was very important, although not, not normally in the way that economists think so. In other words, it wasn't just that people suffered economically, although they did, um, but it was also that the, the, the economic crisis reduced the faith that people had in the in democratic leadership you know, all over the world actually um, you know this idea that somehow Americans know what they're doing you know that even you know Amer you know those bankers know what they're doing you know the the Treasury Department that 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 Western countries have a hold on this very complex world of international economics and can make sense of it the sight of that failure um, I think was truly undermining of um, not just American, but Western prestige. And it had, an, it had a very clear impact on people. And it's important that that's understood because I mean, for example, in a country like Poland, um, Poland is not a country that suffered particularly from that crisis, nor is it a country that has had a bad economic experience over the last 30 years. On the contrary, it's a, Poland is the story of this continual economic success, success growth, you know, high growth rates, um, you know, doubling and tripling living standards. Yeah. And yet they had this and they had this reaction. And I, I think the, and the element of lack of trust, maybe America doesn't know what it's doing was certainly part of that. Well, did we oversell democracy? Did we oversell uh, capitalism? Did we have unreasonable high expectations in central European countries when we pushed that after the wall went down? The United States and 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 Western Europe. No, actually, I, I mean, I I genuinely believe that what's happening in Eastern Europe is not very different from what's happening in Western Europe, and it's not very different from what's happening in the United States. In other words, um, you know, you can point to Poland and Hungary as particularly bad cases of this. Um, you know, they're they're both run by these authoritarian populist political parties. Um, but I don't think that the nature of that problem is very different from what you have in the United States. Um, and, and it sounds, it always sounds strange, particularly Americans, you know, Americans like to talk about their own history. We look back to the civil war, to the failures of reconstruction to explain what's going on now. And that's, that's true. 
Um, but it's also true that much of what's happening in the United States isn't that different from what's happening in other places. So I think you need to point to some deeper, um, you know, some, some some deeper and broader problems that, that afflict all of us. And I, I'm happy to talk about some of those if you'd oh, like. Okay, so related to that, uh, you know Patrick Davies' book, The Great American Delusion, it's related to this. He's, he asks whether the myth of American exceptional, exceptionalism blinded the US from the serious political, social, and economic problems it faces. Um, with all the challenges, both domestic and foreign, will the United States be able to lead now if we don't take care of what's going on in the United States, the divisions within the United States? Oh, I, I, I think very, I very, I very much agree with that analysis that it's very important for America to heal itself to be able to lead. Although I do think that a part of America healing itself is America reestablishing close links with other democracies and rebuilding the idea that we as a nation are committed to this idea of democracy. Um, you know, one, one of the mistakes I think we made in thinking about um, our, particularly our relationship to Europe over the last several decades is that we were helping them. You know, we were, we were there in Europe to build up and protect European democracy. And that's what we were doing there. That's what that long post-war, post-Second World War commitment was about. They're also, in more and more when you look back on the, on the last several decades, it's pretty clear that, that that alliance also helped protect and defend democracy inside the United States. Because it was our national project, because it was what our leaders spoke about, because it was part of who we were and how we defined ourselves around the world, um, that made the idea of democracy very, um, you know, it strengthened it inside the United States as well. And I actually genuinely believe that there's a link between American foreign policy and American domestic policy in that sense as well. And I think it's not a coincidence that the first president to outwardly reject the European alliance and also the alliances with Asian democracies and other democracies around the world um, is also the first, um, you know, has, has caused the biggest crisis in, in, in America's confidence in their own democracy, you know, since, certainly since, um, you know, certainly since the Second World War and maybe since the Civil War. And so he obviously was a populist that that really um, put his arm around polarization sorting in the United States that was going on. And much of that was related to race. Now, one of your cases is the United States, you discuss race, but it's kind of hard not to really drill down on the phenomena of race and, and slavery and its impact today and for you know, 400 years on this continent um, uh, with race. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case anywhere in Europe. Race is not an issue, maybe immigrants, but uh, not race like the United States. What's your reaction to that? I mean, of course, no country is exactly like the United States and our situation, racial situation is unique in many ways. Um, there's no equivalent to the formerly enslaved population that, that, that we have here or no historical reckoning quite of that kind. Um, nevertheless, if you, if you think about it in a slightly broader category, if you talk about fear of demographic change um, and, and um, anxiety about the survival of a certain definition of the nation, um, whether it's you know, an idea of white Christian America or whether it's an idea of white Christian Hungary, um, you can find some similarities and, and you can find some, some sense, you know, the idea that we are losing, that our something traditional is disappearing, that um, something about our nation um, is, is changing and being lost forever, which is, a, which, is a, which is a kind of reactionary sentiment you can hear in, in parts of white America, and you can also hear it in, in Europe, they do have some relation. But yes, I, but I do think, you know, I don't, I don't want to, you know, while I'm saying that there are these problems that you can that connect to all of us, of course, the American situation is remains very specific and, and the solutions here will be different from the ones in, in, in Europe and elsewhere. So you remind me of Hunter Thompson's Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail. Uh, very interesting. Uh, book written on on drugs, uh, but he but he tapped into this uh, the anger and the distrust uh, of government and, and elites in that book. But back 
let's let's go back to you to what you really know well you know it all well but poland and hungary um uh, as you know i've taught in in brussels over the last 16 years uh so i've sort of watched what was happening there and i, I have this basic question will the eu at any point come to grips with Poland and Hungary with respect to its authoritarian tendencies and especially corruption. Uh, there's a great deal of corruption related to the two regimes at this point, in my opinion. Maybe you disagree, but yeah. No, no, I, no. I mean, I would be cautious about calling Poland a regime. I don't think Poland is a dictatorship yet. I mean, that's that's not quite where we are. But but uh, the, the trouble for the European Union, and this is a this is not that different, actually, from the from the political problem that now faces Biden when dealing with these countries, who are, of course, American allies, particularly Poland, who's a close military ally. Um, the, the the problem is is that there are no the EU has no mechanisms. It wasn't set up to police its members in that way. You know, to you know, there's no mechanism for kicking people out. I mean, funny enough, there are a lot of mechanisms for monitoring economic, you know, whether you're spending too much or too little, and so on. Um, but there aren't mechanisms to monitor or punish countries for defying rules about democracy. Um, and so while there, there is now the, a kind of proto mechanism that might come into use in the next year or so, it's not really clear how it works. Um, both Poland and Hungary, but especially Hungary play roles in the broader European party system. And so it's been very difficult, you know, they both have influence in different ways in different parts of the European Union. It's a very difficult thing to do. Um, it is actually, though, my hope that exactly the issue that you raised, which is that over this issue of corruption, um, we might be able to make some progress. In other words, particularly Hungary has been is clearly using EU funds to enrich people around the around the ruling party and around the prime minister. And it may be that the EU can approach this problem through that. And I'm also is I'm hoping very much that the Biden administration also begins to focus on this issue of transnational corruption. Um, money laundering, um, black money in politics, dirty, um, dark money in politics, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and the way in which authoritarian countries use Western countries and corrupt Western countries actually through their use of our banks or our offshore systems. Um, because one of, one of the things that the US and Europe could do together that could both have an impact on Poland and Hungary, but more importantly, a big impact on Russia and maybe even to some extent China, um, and other authoritarian states would be to crack down on these mechanisms that are being used um, by by authoritarians. I mean, focusing on kleptocracy, you know, getting the the old Western alliance, maybe the Western alliance plus the Asian democracies, um, getting them to focus on this problem um, and shut it down um, would, first of all, give democracy some of the back, some of the prestige, the democratic camp, I should say some of the prestige that it's lost in places like Russia, where people say, well, you know, we're corrupt, but so are they. I mean, look, they take our leaders money and, you know, they let them build um, apartment buildings in Manhattan with it. You know, you know, they talk about human rights, but then they, they let all this money um, filter through their system. It would give us back a certain amount of, 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 of prestige. And it would also, I think, genuinely constrain the autocracies, which are, you know, living off, you know, essentially Western Western corruption. So that's a that's I'm one glad, way in which we could refocus the Democratic Alliance. So I'm glad you mentioned this. Frank Vogel, who's one of the co-founders of Transparency International, has a book right now about laundering money from a variety of authoritarian regimes around the world to buy real estate in Manhattan. And he has some prescript, prescriptions about how to stop that. So we're proud of part of the problem. We're allowing that to happen through our banking system and real estate system. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Uh, I didn't mean to say that Poland was that corrupt, but I do know about Hungary and using uh, EU funds for farms uh, that people close to, to their uh, government uh, have purchased uh, dirt cheap and have, have expanded. Um, so uh, there is the social media. Okay, in all of these places, very hard to control. We're seeing that um, in Russia, Myanmar. It looks like they're shutting things down. But but um, what's authoritarian? Authoritarians have not controlled social media in many cases. They're not really controlling it in Hungary, for example. Um, you touch on it 
uh, but I'm sure that you've studied it and you have some opinions on it. Uh, how, you know, how can authoritarians stay in power if they can't control the social media? So first of all, I mean, to, to be clear, when a point I made earlier, which I, you know, which we should probably, you know, I wanted to bring in, which is that I, I do think that the, the internet and social media and the way in which our entire information system has been completely transformed um, in the last, really since, I suppose, since the invention of the iPhone, which I think is 2007, um, is a part of the explanation for the decline of trust in democracy and also for the um, polarization in all of our societies. Um, and so there, there are different ways to talk about this problem. I mean, the, in fact, authoritarian states have found ways to use, um, to, to use social media and to use the tools that, are, that, that, that the internet brings um, to keep themselves in power. So if you look at China, China has created essentially an authoritarian internet where there's the values of surveillance um, um, and you know, are, are, are baked into the system and, 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 the, and, the, and the state has eyes on everybody and uses, um, you, you know, uses the, you know, the, the many of the tools invented actually in Silicon Valley to, to control its population, to push ideas um, and to monitor what's going on. So actually they've found a very, you know, they, they, they use it quite, quite effectively. Um, the Russians have also found a way to use social media and, the, and, the, and to take advantage of the chaos of the modern information. In other words, they deluge their, their population with information, offering massive contradictory explanations of, of difficult stories. I mean, the most famous one was when the MH17, the plane crashed, the, the plane that was flying from the Netherlands to Malaysia in 2014 crashed over Eastern Ukraine after it was shot down by Russian missiles. Um, you know, what did, what did the Putin regime do? It put out dozens of messages about this crash, told everybody something different about it, you know, and, and the result was they created a kind of confusion. So people feel, there was a, an interview that was done on the time with people on the street in Moscow, and they all said, well, we have no idea why this plane crashed and we will never know. It's not possible to find out the truth anymore. So Putin, Russian, Russian disinformation has actually been used to create this sense of chaos, um, that nothing can really be known, everybody's isolated from everybody else. Um, there's no truth, you know, we, we have no idea what's going on. And of course, this is the tactic that the Russians brought to the US and also use in, um, you know, very prominently and freely in other European, in other democracies, especially European democracies as well, using these, um, you know, using confusing messages, conflicting messages, impersonation, um, as they did in the 2016 election and as they continue to do in, um, in, in other places. So they, they've actually weaponized social media to be of advantageous to okay, right. um, and and we didn't, let me finish is that in one of the really main issues you know if you take kleptocracy as one one of the main issues confronting democracies at the moment is that we don't have an answer to that you know we don't have a democratic internet which reflects our values that we can point to you know the values of openness and transparency you know where the rules promote civilized discourse. Um, we have exactly the opposite. We, I don't know how you describe our internet. It's a kind of, it's a kind of oligarchy or an oligopoly, um, but the, you know, where the rules are made untransparently by a small group of people in Silicon Valley. Um, and and the, the, you know, the, even decisions like whether President Trump can have a Twitter account are made you know, by, by an unnamed group of people at a co private company. Um, all of those kinds of decisions need to be brought into the democratic process. It may be that the algorithms that are used to govern conversation and to set the rules for what people hear most of, and you know, at the moment it's mostly things that are very emotional or very angry, that that may should become a public of, a part of public conversation. It may also be that we need to start talking about alternative forms of social media, public interest social media, where the you know where consensus is a value rather than conflict. And, and, and I, I've just written something about this that'll be published soon. And all of these things are technically possible. So this isn't, oh. I'm not dreaming them or making them up, but having this conversation about how we alter social media so that it reflects our values is really important. So are you behind your statement? Are you, are you uh, suggesting that the FCC or some other commission should make decisions about 
what should go on and what shouldn't go on? No, this, this isn't just about monitoring content. Um, okay, this good. is about the structure of the system itself. Yeah. Um, you, you know, how, how do the algorithms work? You know, um, who gets to decide that? Right. Um, you know, should there be a, should there be court, you know, should there be some kind of court system attached to the internet? In other words, if you're thrown off, should you be able to appeal to somebody? Right. right. Um, you know, what, you know, we, we need to begin thinking about how, you know, we, we do govern speech in some ways in real life. Um, and, and we do, I mean, you know, uh, you know, we, you know, we, we have some accepted rules about libel and about, you know, shouting fire in a crowded theater and so on. Um, some of those rules and some of the way of thinking that we're used to using to govern discourse, we need to think about how to make it work online. It's not going to be exactly the same and the, we may need new kinds of institutions, but we are at the beginning of a process of thinking that through. And certainly that came up in the impeachment uh, of Trump uh, in the discussion in the Senate about uh, the linkage between his speech and what happened. Um, and you've you know, you've written Twilight of Democracy, but also the American crisis, what went wrong and how we recover, some of it before January 6th. And you were very hopeful uh, in those books about where we're going. I will not quote you at this point, uh, but I was hopeful after reading, <laughs> reading you, but I, are you still hopeful after what's happened on January 6th? So thanks. So the American crisis, for those who don't know, is actually a collection of stories, it articles is. from the Atlantic. Yeah, right. And I wrote the afterword. And the afterword um, asks, you know, where, what previous periods of American history can we look to for some, you know, for some, some to cheer ourselves up. Um, right. And I talked, I just talk a little bit, it's a very brief essay. I talk a little bit about the progressive era and about the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt. Right. Um, as opposed to Franklin, who's usually the one who gets talked about in these contexts, and the way in which he took a step back and he asked, you know, is, is the system working for everybody? Is American capitalism working? Um, what are the ways that we could regulate it and think about it differently? And this was, of course, the era of trust busting, the creation of antitrust laws. Um, and, and, his, and his goal was not to smash the American system, not to, not to destroy it, you know, as some radicals at the time wanted, but how do we make it more humane? How do we make it work for people? Um, and it actually, it, it is my argument that if you know we can, you, you know, if we were capable of changing the rules, then you know, thinking of a different way for our society to be run, then why can't we do it now? And actually, the the regulation of social media um, is exactly that. I mean, once again, we're talking about big monopolies that that are controlling our information space. Um, and it may not be that antitrust law is the right answer to them, and I, um, but, but thinking big about how we regulate them, how we, um, how we want to, what's the positive, you know, not just what do we want to take down off the internet, what, 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 you know, what, how do we want to communicate in the 21st century, um, that we have, a, you know, we've had these major eras of reform before, you know, you can look at Theodore Roosevelt, you can look at Franklin Roosevelt, um, you can look at the civil rights movement and the legislation that followed that, you know, we do, we are a nation that has changed itself in the past. Um, and so there are reasons why we should, you know, we could, we can, we can hope to be able to change ourselves in the future. So let me share the quote that stuck with me, uh, with the audience, quote, there have been moments in our history and the history of other nations when intelligent leadership healed equally profound divisions without resulting in violence. Well, we had violence on January 6th and you gave me hope that, you know, maybe we can move forward with reform. Uh, it was a shock to all of us that that happened uh, and that we usually, you know, there's been violence in the United States, but usually we solve things through the courts, through elections, through um, getting new people in, into office. Let me share. That, that's that's the promise of democracy. That's the one advantage of democracy right. that it has over other systems is that yeah. you can make changes without violence, and you can yeah. change leadership without violence. The war, a camp campaign means war. The campaigns allow you to make change without killing people, uh, right? Ultimately. So let me change the topic a little bit and and look uh, at authoritarian authoritarian regimes throughout the world but ones that you know well, it seems to me that 
that ones with strong economic growth seem to be getting away with taking freedoms away from their people. And, you know, there's crony capitalism uh, is prevalent in many of these regimes. And in a way, China is there also. Uh, and uh, certainly Russia, but maybe Poland, maybe, maybe Hungary. Uh, why is this the case? Is it that the elite in a society that, that gain economically from what's going on will look the other way when freedoms are taken away? In a way, many uh, mainline conservative Republicans were looking away from what Trump was doing, for example, because they got a tax break, a deregulatory deregul regime, they got th things that they wanted and they really didn't stand up and criticize him for a variety of other um, behaviors, vile behaviors by, by him uh, related to race and, and a lot of other things. Is, uh, do they buy into having freedoms taken away when they are gaining economically in these societies? I mean, I, I feel somewhat awkward making a direct link between the Chinese Communist Party and the Republican Party. I mean, I think they're, <laughs> I think they're different enough that you know maybe they should be answered. In yeah, they're, they're different, but the but, no, but, but is... I mean, cer certainly it's the case that the source of China's legitimacy, of the ruling party's legitimacy, is their ability to move forward. You know, is, is to develop the country and to achieve economic growth, um, and that therefore. The, you know, the real threat to their legitimacy will come the moment when that's no longer true, whenever it, whenever it does come. Um, and it's really that rather than admiration for the Chinese system that, has, that gives China a lot of influence around the world. So whether it's in Africa or in other parts of Asia, you know, the, or in Central Asia, you know, the countries that are now seeking to align themselves with China are, are doing so because they hope to achieve some kind of economic success themselves. And it's in some way the, you know, the contrast between the failure of the perceived failure of the West in 2008 and nine and the Chinese success, particularly in, in for, for developing countries um, that I think has, 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 under, has, um, has given, you know, has taken away a lot of prestige for American democracy. But, you, but your other point is, is also well taken. I mean, one of the things that we learned um, in the United States in the last four years was that, um, uh, big players in our political system, voters, but also leaders inside the system were, were willing to ignore attacks or assaults on democracy if in exchange for other kinds of political goals. Um, they talked themselves into believing that there was a balance to be done, that they could about one thing, they could get an advantage in another way. Some of these were political advantages, sometimes they were economic advantages to their voters. Um, you know, and, and, and what it illustrated was that the value of democracy itself was not as strong as we believed it. Um, and that things that seemed they, that, that everybody had assumed would be absolutely beyond the pale, ways of speaking, ways of, 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 of you know, um, ways of governing um, were accepted by, I would say, if you look particularly at the senior level in the Senate and in some members of cabinet, made the conscious decision to ignore uh, assaults on American democracy and on American democratic norms in exchange for either personal or political power. And I, and I would connect this actually back to the question you asked me at the very beginning, which is um, why people, you know, why my friends in Poland were attracted to, uh, you know, an, a, an authoritarian political party. And it's similar kinds of reasons that they, they see either personal or political gain to be had, and they decide those things are more important than democracy. So you, this brings up the topic uh, of our party system. We have two strong parties. Uh, in some, a few states, we have multiple parties, but we have two strong parties. Uh, it's really important, uh, in my opinion, and I think you believe this too, to have two uh, fairly strong parties competing with each other over how they will govern, what they will do uh, for the commons, for the people. Uh, the Republican Party is a, uh, in a major battle right now between the Trump people and then people like Portman and others who are fiscally conservative. They believe in fr 
free trade, other things that are, they're really, I think, solid public officials are leaving. They're leaving the Senate. And there's a battle that's going to go on for the heart of the Republican Party, in my opinion. My question is, how can we meet the challenges of our democracy that are going on right now if we've got a party that's totally split and uh, doesn't exactly uh, agree with the conservative basis of the Republican Party, um, uh, the, the classic conservative base of the Republican Party. Seems like they believe in a person, a personality, uh, Trump, rather than uh, a philosophy that has driven the party for many years. So uh, the, there are different ways to answer that question. I mean, I think the, maybe I'll answer it by saying that both historically and also recently, um, one of the solutions to far right extremism um, has been the strengthening of the center right. Um, and you can see this, this have played itself out recently in Austria where a center right kind of charismatic young center right Christian democratic leader beat out the rising far right, um, partly by stealing their issues, um, 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 but also by finding ways to isolate and, and, and um, you know, and, and, and discredit them. And what, you know, in the US, we don't have the, in some ways, good fortune of having a multi-party system um, because of the way our, our constitution is written and our rules of voting don't, don't, don't make that easy. Um, but the battle inside the Republican party really is now a battle, you know, can a center right you know, of whatever philosophy, whether it's a, whether it's, whether it's focused on free markets or whether it's focused on social conservatism or whether it's focused on, you know, whatever piece of, 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 the, of the old center right, um, you, know, you know, constellation of ideas it wants to, um, wants to use, whether that center right can draw people away from the authoritarian populism represented by Trump um, and by some of his followers who are still in the party. Um, and so, you know, un un unfortunately for people outside the, the party, we have little influence over that. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a Republican voter from many decades ago. I, I, I don't count myself as one anymore. Well, if you live in Washington, DC, uh, you've got a problem if you're a Republican. <laughs> right, right. I mean, so, I mean that, that's one way to look at the problem. Another question, which is a slightly different one, is what do, the rest of us do about that part of the Republican Party that no longer accepts our voting system, you know, that no longer accepts that our political system works. And that's not the whole party. That's that's the people who are at the Capitol on January 6th and the something like 20% of people who have said they support the assault on the Capitol. And yes, but maybe it's not, maybe it's not really 20%, maybe it's 15 or 10. Either way, it's a very large problem. But um, the, of the 47% uh, percent that voted for Trump about in some polls, and you know, it's, it's only a couple of them, 80% of them agreed with his, uh, his analysis that the, that the election was stolen. Now, maybe that's changed since January 6th, et cetera. You know, we really have 50 Republican parties and, it, and the Republican party to a great extent is dying in the Northeast and it's alive in the cowboy states, the southern states, you know, the rural states. And so the battle will go on, not from a national viewpoint, in my opinion, but it'll go on in those local parties. And those local parties, many of them, uh, they're censoring these people in the House of Representatives that, that uh, voted for impeachment in the Republican Party. They're really, they're really taking over the local party and the local Republicans, the business people and others, they're just not engaging. And I think that may be a problem. What is your reaction? Well, then, to that? then, then everything depends on who votes for them. Um, yeah. And the question then is, um, is, that, is that ideology popular among Americans and, and, um, and how successful will it be? Because of course that also will determine um, how these things play themselves out. I mean, in, you know, in the meantime, as I said, there's this structural issue for the rest of us, which is how do we cope with this anti-systemic group, you know, who, remember that the assault on the Capitol was not, that wasn't Republicans against Democrats. That was a group of people who were trying to disrupt the operation of Congress and prevent the selection of the next president. 
that they were anti-systemic. They were, they were, they, you know, they were going to hang Mike Pence. You know, that right. was, you know, that wasn't, a, it wasn't about, that wasn't just partisanship. That was something a little bit different. That yeah, wasn't um, core. It wasn't a core of the Republican, Republican party leadership at all. I, you know, I don't think. No, but it is, it in, but it's an important minority and it's something that we need to, we need to think how we speak to. And of course the, the lessons from other countries here are, um, you know, are pretty clear, you know, that one of the, one of the tasks for the Biden administration is going to be find ways to change the subject. In other words, find ways to engage those people in some kind of conversation about something important where we don't talk about Trump or we don't talk about whichever are the big culture war issues that divide us. We didn't focus on whether it's abortion or immigration, but instead we talk about rebuilding the country. We talk about, I don't know, the vaccines, um, and that the Biden administration finds some way to engage um, that group, um, you know, while, while, while not forcing everybody into a room to argue it out because that, or that argument might not succeed. I mean, we may discover that in, in, the, in the next several years, we don't have much in common. Um, and so that makes it all the more imperative that both national politics and state politics and local politics actually, that leaders find other 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 things that we can engage on other other ways that we can communicate and other topics that we can discuss so where do you and george will and all of the republican leaning columnists go uh in the future so i, I don't qualify as a republican leaning columnist anymore um, <laughs> and i really had no problem voting for joe well Biden. i know that you endorsed hillary I should tell everybody that. <laughs> right. No, no, I, I, I endorsed Hillary because I was I, I identified Trump from the very beginning as an authoritarian populist, and much of what he was saying reminded me of um, things that I, you know, that I'd heard in Europe, um, and I also felt that his Russian connection, also very early on, was creepy and yeah. um, required some required some explanation, but but. No, no, I, 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 my, the person who really put me off the Republican Party was Sarah Palin, and that was some time ago. So. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean oh. to push you into that box. Mm -hmm. right. yeah, sorry, this sorry. would be a, this would be a great time to to go ahead and and jump in if you guys don't mind and and try to answer a few of these excellent questions that we have had come in uh, from the Q and A. So, and David, could I interrupt for just a second? Let Ann know that we we have students all around the world. I have several from Ukraine. Uh, and I've been there several times to help them with their reform efforts. And uh, so some of these questions may be coming from around the world, Ukraine, Italy, Kazakhstan, variety of places. Sorry, David, go ahead. No, that's great. The, the list doesn't tell us where they're coming from. But the first one that I have for you uh, is from Cornelia Bacheska. Uh, she asks, or she says, uh, thank you for this excellent discussion, and then asks, how do democratic regimes push against the allure of authoritarianism if democratic countries also need those authoritarians to deal with multiple global problems like climate change? Excellent question. <laughs> I mean, I think we can walk and chew gum at the same time. So we managed with the, so, you know, in, in, in the long ago Cold War years, we managed to have productive arms negotiations with the Soviet Union while criticizing their human rights record. And even while active, actively helping Soviet dissidents and, and speaking to them through Radio for Europe and other and Radio Liberty and other, other methods. So um, you know, I don't see any reason why we can't engage with China on the subject of climate change, um, while at the same time, um, you know, making our, you know, for example, reinforcing um, international institutions that have that were set up long ago to 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 hold governments to account um, and to criticize them for abuse of power. Um, many of those many of those organizations institutions have declined. Um, I, I don't see why we can't do both at once. Um, uh, you know, I don't see why we can't, um, uh, you, you know, offer alternatives to Chinese propaganda, um, you know, in the countries where it's active. I don't see why we, you know, why we can't compete with China ideologically, you know, while at the same time, you know, looking for things we can work with them together on. I mean, in a way, it's the international version of what I just said about domestic politics. Um, it may be that we find there's a whole area of things we can't talk to China about, um, and we won't ever be able to. Um, but you know that doesn't mean we need to go to war with them, and it also doesn't mean that we can't also 
at the same time talk about climate change. It's in China's interest also to speak about climate change. Um, and so that seems to be a, um, you know, you know, an, an excellent, you know, an excellent description of, of, a, of a place where we can, where we can talk to them. I mean, not, not everything, not everything has to be linked. I mean, this is an old argument going back in foreign yeah. policy for many years, should they be linkage or not? Um, um, and maybe we need to revisit some of those thoughts and ideas for this new era. Could I add something to that, David, very quickly? It's related to democratization. Uh, how can we push for democratization when people uh, look at our problems of race and, and maldistribution of wealth and access to the ballot and a variety of other things? Isn't it kind of difficult? I'm sorry, I'm, I, didn't, I didn't hear what you, uh, what, what you just said. Well, it wasn't posed as well as it should be, Anne. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's that, Something blinked off, I apologize. Oh, that's right. So we, you know, uh, going back to Biden's statement, but also we as a nation has pu pushed for democratization, human rights and other issues and institutions, the building blocks of democracy. How can we do that when people around the world turn back and say, well, wait a minute, you've got a whole lot of things that are wrong with your democracy. And you, we saw it clearly with, with Trump, but also now with uh, limits to access to the ballot uh, in, in the United States, efforts to limit people getting to the ballot. Isn't that kind of hard? I mean, I, again, I think, it's, I think it's something that we can do with others. Um, I don't think we can stand up and say, we're promoting democracy because we're so great. Um, I do think that together with um, European democracies, with Asian democracies, with Latin American and African democracies, um, I think that we can, um, you know, we can we can speak jointly to some of these problems, um, and we can, and as I said, we can also offer constructive strategies. Um, so again, it's not, you know, I think there's this misunderstanding that democracy promotion is something the United States should do by itself and. It should do it through fighting wars. I mean, this was never historically um, what what the United States ever did. Um, it's it's a it's a real aberration. Um, but but speaking, finding ways to speak as a group with other democracies, um, finding a strategy um, that you know that will last over the long term, focusing on um, the reform of the information space, the reform of kleptocracy, um, offering people some you know better solutions. I mean, you know, people who are living in swamped by information chaos in their countries, um, you know, if we can point them towards something better, you know, then we're making, you know, then we're offering them something real. So, I mean, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think it's about America's power of example. You know, we, we don't have that. We used to have more, you know, we used to have more of a power of example. Now we have less of one, but I do think there are other ways in which we can, we can, be a positive force to promote democracy around the world. Right, thank you. And we had a certain amount of arrogance about what we were until what happened recently. David, sorry, go ahead with another question. Thanks, I just wanna to try to get through a, a couple more here. Uh, Dennis Landis asks, would stronger educational systems, or I suppose you could just talk about any kind of educational reforms you'd like, uh, reduce the allure of magical thinking and uh, autocracy? So certainly, I mean, this is a, this is a, um, you know, because people mean so many broad things by education. I mean, there are two things that we could certainly use more of. Um, one is something that's called media literacy, um, helping, you know, as a subject in school, helping people understand how to, young people, how to navigate the internet, helping them understand what the internet does. I mean, many of them are beginning to understand, understand this intuitively better than older people actually, but understanding that you know the reason you're seeing this series of images and stories is because the algorithm thinks that's what you want to see um, and understanding that you should be able to have more control over over what you want to see and this by the way is one of the other reasons I want to reform the internet is that I want people to have more um, agency in deciding what it is they want to see and, and read um, and the second area obviously is civic education and this means such a wide thing to so many people that um, you know that, that you know that, that you can get very bogged down in this too. But thinking about civic education as an ongoing, lifelong, you know, it's not just something you do in some dusty social studies classroom in eighth grade, you know, but again, that it's built into 
um, American history exams, into AP history, um, that it's built into curricula, um, and that there are, um, maybe it's something that NGOs should do, maybe it's something state or local governments could do, but that there are ongoing online campaigns, I mean, the way that we fight against smoking or drunk driving <laughs> through, through campaigns. I mean, campaigns to teach people and remind them how institutions are supposed to work. Um, remind them how they should be using local government. Here's what your member of Congress's office does. Um, here's how you can be in touch with it. Um, giving people some, um, some you know, better tools you know, to allow them to access, the, access democracy. And also, I mean, but there's a, there's a flip side of that, which is that um, voters and, and you know, ordinary people of all kinds actually also, I think, need to step up to the plate and begin to understand that you know, democracy is not like water coming out of a tap, you know, that you can just ignore it and let it run and, you know, it'll always be there when you want it. You know, it might be that it's more like water in a well and you might have to go and get it and drag it out and, you know, sterilize it. Um, and that being involved in your local community or in state politics or in a party or in an NGO or supporting something financially, you know, supporting, you know, one of the great democracy groups that US democracy groups that have sprung up in recent years, this might now be part of being a citizen and, and, and we all need to be active. So it's not just, it's not so much education per se, it's, you know, focusing on these things that would help people be better and more active um, uh, citizens. Thanks a lot. So uh, David Simpson, I uh, wonders if, you know, given the rise of authoritarianism and contradistinction to democracy, if the old, um, you know, distinctions between left and right and liberal and conservative are still as, as useful uh, as they used to be. Oh, so this is a theme I've been writing about for a long time that, I, that I, I, I do think that a lot of the old party divisions, you can see this very clearly in Europe where you have multi-party systems. The old center left versus center right division, you know, social democrats, and in Europe it's Christian, they're called Christian Democrats. Um, it really doesn't make sense anymore. It doesn't reflect the range of issues that concern people. Um, and you can see it in, in systems that are more flexible than ours. You can see it by the rise of green parties. Um, actually, you, the rise of far right and far left parties. You know, you can see that there are there are issues that aren't that just aren't covered um, traditionally. I mean, in the U.S., this is we've often you know, the way it's, it's, it's sort of an issue that has to be dealt with inside parties because our system is inflexible and it's very difficult to achieve a, for a third party to, to make headway. Um, and this is, the, you know, we've already discussed the argument going on inside the Republican Party, but there's similar kinds of arguments inside the Democratic Party as well. Um, and and yes, I do think we'll see a realignment around different issues. You can already see it happening around economics. Um, uh, you know, uh, you know that the, the 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 things that separated us and the things that that we thought were most important aren't going to be the most important going into the future. And that I do hope that the party system um, begins to reflect this. I do think that one of the reasons for the decline of respect for democracy or the loss of interest that happened over the last several decades in both Europe and the U.S. but also around the world was the fact that the parties became very ossified. They began to seem like, you know, professional organizations run by professionals for the sake of professionals, and they really lost their contact to ordinary people. I mean, if you think of where social democracy originally came from, I mean, it sprung out of the trade union movement, um, and it was, you know, and the trade union movement was real people having real issues, um, and the party was a product of that. I mean, once, but as the trade union movement declined, social democracy became less relevant to people. So it may be that reorientation, re, you know, re, rethinking of who's a party or how a party should be, maybe it should be a coalition of organizations, um, is, you know, we're really right for that now. But And, you know, we're a pluralist system and we have a lot of NGOs, a lot of organization outside the party trying to influence the party, but also directly. And there is a hypothesis that when you have big pieces of legislation like the Affordable Care Act, you needed a whole lot of groups outside mm -hmm. pressuring it you know, the docs, the hospitals, even the health insurance people, the AARP, all of these are very Im important and go sort of against the thesis of bowling alone. There are a lot of people that belong to these organizations and they do have an impact, but it's outside the party. Uh, and so we should not forget that they're around and they will have an influence and they, 
And I think Biden gets it, by the way, and he's bringing in the leaders from a variety of viewpoints from these groups that represent uh, power outside the party. Many, in yeah, and, and those groups also offer a way to be active for people who don't feel particularly sympathetic with either of the parties. I mean, right, right. A way of being engaged in politics. Yeah. So I'm going to ask just one more question, uh, and this is from my, my old colleague from long ago, uh, Bert Rockman, who I'm happy to see <laughs> is with us here. Um, so it, it's a long setup here, but uh, bear, bear with me for a second. Although in the U.S., much of the attention regarding authoritarianism has been at the federal level, the states and regions have become increasingly politically homogenous. Much of the subversion of democratic practices, especially access to voting, has been at this level where one partyism dominates. In addition, the focus on control of the courts by one party or the other implies a dim diminution of democratic culture. To put it another way, our politics seems to be increasingly zero sum, much like the onset of the Civil War. Any suggestions as to what is within the realm of possibility to diffuse this sense of zero sum, winning or losing? So, so, so first of all, yes, of course, it's a very astute observation that you know, much of this is in some, well, in some, in some cases, it's even worse at the state level. Um, and, you know, some of the, some of the solutions to this are, you know, not very original to me, you know, could we, could we be, you know, the voting, a, a new voting rights act, um, a, you know, some, you know, national federal level um, rules, you know, that would change gerrymandering and make it more, um, you know, you know, make, make it, and, and I mean, make it much more difficult for, states for um, parties that win at the state level to, to, to ensure their eternal victory. Um, and so there are some, you can think of some legislative ways um, to, to, to be active at the state level. Um, but I think actually much of what I said about the federal level also applies down there. And again, it's these questions of, is there enough civic engagement? Um, is there, you know, are, are people involved in voter registration campaigns? I mean, we just saw how um, how, how, how important civic groups were and activists in Georgia in, in changing the nature of politics of a, you know, of a state that had been, you know, very monolithic for a long time. Um, and it seems to me that, you know, looking, looking at the grassroots for help in making those changes, as well as talking about legal and regulatory changes we could make at the federal level, I think that the combination of those two um, is the best solution. So behind your statement, you argue that there needs to be some competition. And in many cases, there's no competition. You know, the, the real election is the primary election and that's where the battle will be between in the Republican party uh, with the Trumpsters and, and other people. Uh, competition does create uh, people coming to the middle, uh, which, you know, you were saying, you know, doesn't happen anymore. Going back to Anthony Downs, you know, economic theory democracy we say you know that's good we go in the middle and we don't get everything we want but uh it's it's better than people on the far right and far left you you in your in your book talk about the growth of the far right and far left and i have colleagues david from oregon on the line i'm from oregon uh and they have really had had it with the far right and the far left in portland sure they, they are radical centrists like me. <laughs> and uh, it seems that that is growing in the state of Washington also uh, and other places. Uh, I'm worried about that, are you? Yeah, well, there, there's a phenomenon that I wrote about this year called cumulative extremism, you know, in which the extremism of one side provokes extremism on the other side and then gradually sucks moderates in. I mean, this is how, you know, this is how you get violence in Northern Ireland. This is how you, you know, you got in, in, in Northern England um, violence between kind of far right groups and Islamic um, um, groups as well. So it's a, I mean, there is no question that, that they, they feed off one another and they, um, you know, and they, and they encourage one another. I mean, one of the things I was most worried about had Trump been reelected is that would have been absolutely the, you know, the, go, the green light for a real far left to, um, you know, to, 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 to get going in the United States, because, you know, there, there was Trump, you know, the kind of caricature, you know, of what, of what the left most hates about America. 
um, in power and reelected. And we would then have had, I think, the growth of a lot more extremism there too. So one of the chances we now have with Trump losing is that we can damp down some of the anger and the, you know, the tendency to violence on both sides. Yeah, right. So David, I think we're out of time, right? Right, we are out of time. And, and I just want to thank, uh, thank you, Anne, uh, for, for this fascinating discussion. I, I, I know that I've learned a lot from it. And, and thank you, Jim, as well. Uh, I, I just want to give you both a, a virtual hand here. Uh, and otherwise, we- well, I, want to I want to thank Anne, too, and also encourage everybody to go out and buy this book. It's Absolutely. excellent. It is not like political science that'll put you to sleep. It's, uh, <laughs> it's very short too. It's short and it's, it's really, you. really good. And it covers many of the things that we have here. We'll all look forward to your articles in, in Atlantic when it comes online and in, and in hard copy. And thank you, Anne, very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. We're much appreciated. And, and, and thanks to the audience too. Right. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.